We welcome you, brothers and sisters in Christ, to this online worship service of the Detroit Lakes United Methodist Church. We are so glad you have joined us as we worship together, but apart, on this Memorial Day weekend. Today we celebrate the fact that Jesus has risen and saved us from our sins, but no doubt many of you have joined us here with heavy hearts, sorely missing those people that you have lost to wars and conflicts. You come with pride and thanksgiving to honor those who served and died for our country. Please know that even though we can't physically be together now, there are many people who are virtually hugging you and recognizing your loss. And know that God is with you as well, comforting and guiding you through this weekend of remembrance. Let's begin our time of worship with this call to worship. Springtime changes are bursting forth around us. The earth is awakening in a display of wondrous color. The celebration of Easter Sunday is over, but the message of new life, new awakenings, and new possibilities remain. Glory to God. Alleluia. And let us pray. We thank you, O God, that Jesus Christ has risen in glory like a bright morning star to light up the darkness and bring hope to our lives. Fill us this day with your spirit of love and power that we may bring hope to others and reflect your majesty. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy of the avenger. When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him, a son of man that you look after him? You made him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. All the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. I'm Rick Peckman, ministry coordinator here at the United Methodist Church. Um, we're out in the Memorial Garden. It's Memorial Weekend, so it seemed like the appropriate place to be. On my phone, it says Memorial Day is a day for remembrance of those who have died in service and to our uh, uh, died in service to our country. On this special weekend, and especially on Monday, we com commemorate the sacrifices the soldiers have made um, for us. The, I know I've shared this story with us before in the past, but it, you know, a good story is a good story and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. It's called The Wall by Eve Bunting. The Wall. This is the wall, my grandfather's wall. On it are the names of those killed in the war long ago. Where's my grandpa, grandpa's name, I ask. We have to find it, my dad says. He and I have come a long way for this, and we walk slowly, searching. The wall is black and shiny as a mirror. In it, I can see dad and me. I can see the bare trees behind us and the dark flying clouds. A man in a wheelchair stares at the names. He doesn't have legs. I'm looking, and he sees me looking and smiles. Hi, son. Hi. His hat is a soft squash green, and there are medals on it. His pants are folded back, and his shirt is a soldier's shirt. A woman as old as my grandma is hugging a man as old as my grandpa would be. They are both crying. Shh, he whispers. Shh. Flowers and other things have been laid against the wall. There are little flags, an old teddy bear, and letters weighted with stones so they won't blow away. Someone left a rose with a droopy head. Have you found Grandpa yet? I ask. No, Dad says. There are so many names. They are listed under the years that they were killed. I found 1967. That's when my Grandpa died. Dad runs his finger along the road of print, and I do too. The letters marked side by side like soldiers. They're nice and even. It's better printing than I can do. The wall is warm. Dad is searching and searching. Albert A. Jensen, George Baronsky, Charles Munson, he mutters. His fingers stop moving. His voice blurs. 
my dad. He was just my age when he was killed. Dad's rubbing the name, rubbing and rubbing as if he wants to wipe it away. Maybe if he, maybe he just wants to remember the way it feels. He lifts me so I can touch it too. We've got paper. Dad puts it over the letters and rubs with, rubs on it with the pencil. So the paper goes dark, but the letters show up white. You've got parts of the other guy's name on it too, I tell him. Dad looks at the paper. Your grandpa won't mind. They probably were his friends anyway, I say. Dad nods. Maybe so. Can we go to the river? Or a, a young a man and a boy walk past. The boy asks, Can we go to the river now, Grandpa? Yes, the man takes the boy by the hand, but button your jacket. It's cold. My dad stands very still with his bed with his head bent. A bunch of girls in school uniforms come down the path. Their teachers with them. They are all carrying um, little flags. This is the wall of the dead soldiers, Miss Goober says. Um, uh, or is this the wall of the dead soldiers, Miss Goober? One of them asks in a loud voice. The names are are the names of the dead, but the wall is for all of us. The teacher tells them. They make a lot of noise and ask a lot of questions. And all that time, my dad just stands there with his head bowed and I stand beside him. The girls stick their flags in the dirt in front of the wall and leave. Then it is quiet again. Dad folds the paper that has Grandpa's name on it and puts it in his wallet. He slides out a picture of me one of the yucky ones that they took in school. Mom made me wear a tie. Dad puts the picture on the ground below Grandpa's name. It blows away. I put it back and pile little, some little stones on top. My face smiles up at me from under the stones. Grandpa won't know who I am. I tell Dad. I think he will, Dad says. I move closer to him. It's sad here. He puts his hand on my shoulder. I know, but, is it a, but it is a place of honor. I'm proud that your grandfather's name is on this wall. I am too. I am. I am, but I'd rather have my grandpa here, taking me to the river, telling me to button my jacket because it's cold. I'd rather have him here with me. The Wall A note. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial honors the men and women of the armed forces of the United States who served in the Vietnam War. On it are listed the names of those who gave their lives and those missing in action. The memorial is located in Washington, D.C. On the long black wall, there are more than 58,000 names. The wall, remembering those who served for us. Rest in peace. Amen. Our second scripture reading is, I have heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that our God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is, what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches to his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe. 
according to the working of his great power. God put his power and work in Christ when he raised him from dead and from the dead and seated him as his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and, and dominion, and above every name that is not that is named. Not only this age, but also is the age, in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and made them and made him the head over all things for the church, which is which is his body and the, the fullness of him who fills all. Ephesians chapter 5, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Grace and peace to you from God, our creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you just catch the majesty of the scriptures just read? Capturing the beauty and power of God, the psalmist proclaims, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who are we that you are aware of us and care for us? Well, what a picture. The psalmist is clear. We are not the center of the universe. God is. We are the created. God is the creator. Today, Christians are celebrating the ascension of Jesus Christ to heaven. For 40 days after his resurrection, Luke tells us in Acts 1, verse 3, he continued to appear to them and tell them about the kingdom of God. But on the 40th day, Jesus ascended. Now granted, we tend not to make too much out of this day. You may have noticed that Hallmark does not have a line of cards for Ascension Sunday. We make much more out of Christmas and Easter, those, though, though those are the other huge days, that and Pentecost in the church. And we make a whole lot more out of those really big days of Valentine's, Halloween, St. Patrick's Day. I could go on and on, all holidays that began with some religious or spiritual history, somewhat diluted over the last years. In parts of Europe, I understand, Ascension Day still is celebrated, but often is combined with another holiday. For example, in Germany, it's called Vatertag, Father's Day. Ascension Day just happens to be celebrated right along with it, and people don't tend to go to church as much. They end up drinking beer in a beer hall. But for those of you who enjoy trivia, Ascension Day always comes on a Thursday every year. The church just celebrates it the following Sunday. Trivia notwithstanding, what Ascension Day brings to us is a day of great theological significance. Ascension Sunday helps us to remember that though God is revealed in different ways, those three roles of creator, redeemer, sustainer all comprise one God. It is also clear from the scripture that one God envisioned the church to assume the role and mission of Jesus Christ between his ascension and his return in majesty. Now, we may no longer experience the earthly presence of Jesus Christ among us, but his presence is alive as the church carries out its mission. So I've been wondering these past few weeks, what does this mean for Christians in the midst of COVID and the many struggles that we have faced coming from it? One very practical theologian, George Thompson, describes it well when he says, the ascension means that when the road is as rough as sandpaper, when decisions are as complex as a Rubik's cube, when friends are few and things are caving in like a rock slide, we can lift up our heads in hope and expectation for Jesus is in the place of highest authority and power. Jesus is not a mere teacher who walked the dusty roads of Palestine and died on the cross in innocence. He is instead planned, a planned gift. There's a Christmas carol, Good Christian Friends Rejoice, and it says it well. He hath opened the heavenly door, and we are blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Now, in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, he stresses the importance of the ascension. Listen. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, 
far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in all the ages to come. Jesus has indeed ascended in majesty. The church, however, remains in the world as Christ's body. His earthly mission continues in you. One of my very favorite writers is also a powerful preacher. Her name is Barbara Brown Taylor, and she vividly captures how all of this works in a wonderful sermon called He Who Fills All in All. This is what she captures. Imagine a four-tiered mountain in which God's glory spills over into Christ, Christ's glory spills over or pours over into the church, and the church's glory drenches the whole universe. That is what Paul can see as clear as day, the perfection of creation through the agency of the church. Then later on, she continues, I've been using the future tense out of sheer disbelief, but Paul doesn't. He uses the past and present tense. Paul writes, and as he has put all things under his feet, and has made him the head over all the things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Not coincidentally, Paul wrote those words from prison, and shortly afterwards he was put to death. Nonetheless, note the belief that ultimately the church will be successful in fulfilling our mission. Do you believe in the mission? Do we understand and believe in the power of the church to change the world? Do we still believe that God remains God? <clears throat> there are times when we all wonder about the potential of the church. I served with a bishop in the early 1980s, Bishop Ed Bolton, who was fond of saying to his cabinet members, I've left the church a thousand times in my mind. You see, the church has an earned reputation of being less grace-filled than it is supposed to be, all too often relating to the world as fractured and quarrelsome. Some, including myself, have described the church as somewhat organizationally bloated, and yet Bishop Ed Bolton never left, as I hope we will choose never to leave. Instead, Ed continued to believe in the mission of the church, and he used his gifts and graces to reconcile a hurting world and achieve the mission. As a student in England long ago, I would come awake on early Sunday mornings to the majestic pealing of church bells. Now, it seemed at the time, although I'm sure I'm incorrect about it, that every church had a bell, and some of them had many bells. It was like a an, not an artificial carillon, but a real one. And every bell rang on Sunday mornings, calling the nation to worship. It was a glorious peal, and I would lay back on my bed with the windows open and just simply enjoy it. And yet when I went to worship, it was obvious that few were responding to the call. England has majestic cathedrals and small, quaint prayer chapels but except in rare cases, usually involving war or crisis, the pews are growing to be empty. The pubs and cricket lawns are the preferred places for people to meet, for emotional support and fellowship, and to find meaning. What this means is that people search for more than the church was able to provide. They found other places to offer them more than the church could offer. Interesting, isn't it? Taylor unequivocally writes what we need to hear on this Ascension Sunday, or any day. She writes, Christ still is giving his blessing to a ruined church. He cannot or will not be separated from the body. What God has joined together, let no one put asunder. Powerful words, challenging vision. I find it amazing and absolutely inspiring that during our present adversities, Christians have gathered to worship together, albeit virtually, 
Some of you not only tune into our broadcast, but then you go on to a neighboring church's broadcast or a friend's broadcast of their church. Our eyes have been opened in fresh ways. Due to physical distancing, we've been unable to worship in our sanctuaries together. Instead, our homes and our offices and our backyards and patios have become those sanctuaries as we praise the one God and find hope for tomorrow. The psalmist reminds us of the divine majesty when he writes, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the sun and the stars which you have set in place. We have been witnessing God's majesty and power to touch lives and heal the sick, provide for the anxious, providing hope and the aggrieving with comfort. God's power, God's majesty. Some of you may remember, as I do, that on Christmas Eve 1968, three men orbited around the moon, 240,000 miles above the Earth in Apollo 8. William Anders, Jim Lovell, and Frank Borman celebrated the historic occasion not by popping a cork, but instead by reading aloud words that many of you will recognize quickly. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. As they contemplated the earth and the moon, their first response was not about human grandeur. Their first response was about God. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Recall, though we are not the center of the universe, yet we occupy a unique and special place because God designed it that way. We have significance because God gives us significance. The church is significant in continuing the mission of the Christ in this in-between time between his ascension and his return again. So join the team. See the great power of God all around us. Share the love of God with others. Help them to join the team the team of global reconciliation with the one God who loves and created them. As an aside, have you ever seen a Credit One or a Capital One credit card commercial? They're pretty creative, although sometimes they're a little annoying. People in the commercials take out their credit cards to make a purchase and discover very suddenly that those charges are going to kill us. And suddenly there's an attack of Huns or pirates or something else that's evil. And yet the attack is stopped cold as the individual holding the credit card remembers they have the no-hassle Capital One card. And we hear that all-too-familiar phrase, what's in your wallet, as the commercial ends. What could we find in God's wallet? Not credit cards, to be sure. God doesn't need to use a credit card. But like many of us, we probably would find a photo or two or three of loved ones. God's wallet would not just carry photos of persons with perfect pedigrees. There might be a few unsavory folk photographed, a few surprises. For example, Pilate might be featured, the thieves on the cross, the brothers of Joseph, so jealous over that beautiful, colorful robe. There might be a shot of Rahab in all of her glory. After all, she became the great, 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 continued on, grandmother of Jesus Christ. And of course, there might be a photo of you. And I hope of me too. In our home, in our kitchen, a Christmas gift from Gary has taken up residence. It's a welcome gift. I enjoy it. It's called the Echo Show 5, and Alexa tells me how to make crepes, even though I would never make a crepe. She gives me the morning headlines as I prepare breakfast and makes me laugh over a daily joke if I ask her for one. Like all of her predecessors, such as the Echo Dot, Alexa has been created to answer questions that I can ask, at least within limits. I remember that there was a child who told her elderly grandmother of the wonders of Alexa to answer any of her questions. Her grandmother was skeptical. Oh, it's true, said the child. 
<clears throat> think of something, anything. Alexa's going to know the answer. There was a long pause, and then Grandma asked in a very serious voice, Alexa, how is Aunt Helen feeling today? Well, Alexa doesn't know how Aunt Helen is feeling, but God does. We are not the center of the universe. We have significance because God has given us significance, and your Creator loves you. The church has significance because Jesus bequeathed his mission to Christians to continue the mission. He commissioned you at his ascension. And so let us not be faulty in our discipleship. With grace, integrity, and best practices, we can live committed to acts of loving care and respect to each other, to all the world's people, and to the globe on which we live. The theologian Walter Rauschenbusch put into prayer much of what we have talked about today. Let me just share it with you. O oh God of all times and places, we pray for your church, which is set today amid the perplexities of a changing order and face to face with new tasks. Baptize upon her a great responsiveness to duty, a swifter compassion with suffering and an utter loyalty to your will. Help her to proclaim boldly the coming of your kingdom. Put upon her lips the ancient gospel of the Lord. Fill her with the prophet's scorn of tyranny and with a Christ-like tenderness for the heavy laden and the downtrodden. Bid her cease from seeking her own life lest she lose it and make her valiant to give her life to humanity, that like her crucified Lord, she may mount up by the path of the cross to a higher glory through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey, it's your contemporary music director, Beth Kelly, with my mom, Jean Livingood. We'll be singing God You Reign. <laughs> Thank you.
You know, one of the things that we have in our home, and I'll bet you do in yours as well, is Band-Aids. This is a big Band-Aid. We tend to use it much more than we thought we ever would. Small Band-Aid. We even put Band-Aids on greeting cards, sending God's kisses and God's gifts of healing to people in need. Today, I'd like to invite you to create a Band-Aid prayer with me. Find a Band-Aid in your home. Think about somebody for whom you are praying for healing. Two names from our own church. Clip that or tape it to your refrigerator door, and every time you go past it, pray for those who need healing. Thank God that God is not only the creator, the redeemer, the sustainer, but God is also a healer. Let us pray today for many things. First, a prayer of praise. I praise God for our trustees and the work that they are doing and have been doing. And I thank all volunteers who have now ended their task of removing snow, but they did it so very well. I praise God for all who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. May God bring meaning to you in the year ahead. I praise God for our church leadership, including Bishop O, our district superintendent, Lori Cantonen, the, De Dakota, the Detroit Lakes United Methodist Church staff, and the elected leadership. And also I praise God for volunteers who are just simply emerging during this time to contact people and to remind them of their love for them. We also pray for healing. We pray for Pastor Brenda and Tom as she continues to recuperate at home. And I ask that you would remember the celebration that is being planned for them and hope that you'll be a part of it on Saturday, June 6th from 1 until 3. We pray this day for Ken and Nelma Ken has been battling illness. Betty Welch, Jan Campbell, Steve and Nancy Sunby, Bob Marin and his family, baby Eloise Rose Champa, the Daniels family, and for Mavis Logging on the passing of her sister last week. You have others that you are praying for. I invite you to continue to pray for them, giving God the glory for all that God can and will do. Let us pray in silence together. And now let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. That we will be holding a farewell drive through party for Pastor Brenda and Tom, her husband. This event will take place on Saturday, June 6th, from 1 to 3 p.m. in the parking lot of the church. I hope that many of you will be able to swing by and bid Pastor Brenda farewell as she wraps up an amazing 11-year ministry here in Detroit Lakes. And as always, if you would like to give an offering to the church, you can either mail your check to the church. Ellen, Rick, and I take turns uh, being at the church to get the mail in every day, so rest assured that your mail won't sit in the mailbox for too long. And the second way that you can give is online through our website, dlumc.org. You can click the Donate Now tab on the left side of the screen to give. You can do this each time you want to give an offering, or you can set up recurring donations. 
If you have any troubles or questions with or about giving, please don't hesitate to contact the church office. We are so very grateful for your faithful giving during this time. Go forth into the world, knowing that your creator, redeemer, and sustainer are one God, and you have been commissioned to go into the world and continue the mission of Jesus Christ. Love, provide grace, and heal as you can. Share the word and invite people to join the team, the team of reconciling the world to the one God. Amen.